They should be the most innocent members of society. But children can be capable of the most sadistic, premeditated and brutal murders. They beat him and hit him with a bottle. One of them stabbed Jay straight through the heart. What drives these kids to kill men, women, friends, family? She was determined that her mother had to die. Even their teachers. This was the first occasion upon which a teacher had been killed in class in the course of conducting a lesson. Could they be born evil? It did have a weird, dark sense of humour. He was a little bit different to most of the other kids. He was aggressive, threatening and dangerous. Or are they victims of their environment? There was a lot of gangs, there was a lot of violence, a lot of drug abusers. With exceptional access to real police tapes. The voices are talking to me, you need to make a sacrifice or we're going to come and get you, you need to do it. And interviews with those closest to the victims and the perpetrators. A red mist had simply descended. <laughs> we reveal what made them such savage killers. In March 2014, the body of a man was found stabbed to death in Colchester's Castle Park. The day Jim died is the day I died. Three months later, a university student was brutally murdered in broad daylight. He came from behind and launched his, his knife attack on her. With a serial killer on the loose, the town was gripped by fear. The whole community were just scared to go out. After a 14-month manhunt, the killer was finally caught while he lay in wait for his third victim. She said that she saw pure evil in his eyes. Shockingly, the person responsible was a 15-year-old schoolboy, James Fairweather. He was a deeply disturbed young man. But what turned a boy once described as well-behaved, kind and sensitive into a murder-obsessed teen, now dubbed Britain's youngest serial killer? We were alerted to a major incident, and there was a real sense at this point that something, something bad's happened. In the early hours of the 29th of March, 2014, Colchester in Essex was rocked by a shocking murder. Brutal and tragic murder. The family had been left devastated. James was murdered. He was attacked frenziedly by James Fairweather to the point there were more than 100 stab wounds. Some of these stab wounds were really vicious, including stab wounds to the eye, and that was one of the real standout details. The victim of this deadly attack was James Atfield, a 33-year-old father of four, known as Jim by his friends and family. Smashing smile, cheeky grin, just all-round funny guy, really. Jim had suffered a brain injury in a traffic accident, affecting his mobility and reasoning. Several years on, he'd made huge progress in his recovery and was just getting his life back to normal. He always had a little joke on hand and things like that. He loved his karaoke. He used to get on his chopper bike and he used to race round with me on the back and stick his bum out so I'd fall off. So, yeah, it was good childhood. I was due to meet Jim that night, but he cancelled. I don't know why. I remember actually messaging him and saying how upset I was. I wish I hadn't now, because I'll see what happened to him that night. I can never take those words back. Jim Atfield had been on a night out in Colchester. Uh, as he often did, he went for a few drinks by himself and he was making his way home. James decided to walk through Castle Park that night, which was a shortcut. Stopped halfway to have a cigarette. Obviously, must have dozed off at some point during the evening. 
and then that's when he got attacked. This vulnerable, slumbering person was then set upon for no apparent reason and with no motive and, and violently killed. Jim was actually still alive when he was found. He must have laid there in pain and just bleeding to death. It's the sort of thing you really don't want to imagine, let alone live. What was particularly scary was that James Atfield was such a vulnerable man um, who had no beef with anyone. We had extensively covered the initial murder. We'd run a lot of appeals, including with, with Jim's family. And at the time, the coverage was starting to fall away a little bit. So we got a call to say there's a lot of police activity in this particular area along the Sallybrook Trail, just, just outside the Grimstead Estate. We had been told that every entrance into Sallybrook Trail had been blocked off by police cars. Just three months after Jim Atfield's death, a second frenzied knife attack struck Colchester. The victim was 31-year-old student, Nahid al from Saudi Arabia. Nahid al was on her way to the University of Essex campus, uh, where she was studying an English course, and she was stabbed on the Salary Brook Trail. Nahid had come to the UK to study English as part of her PhD. She'd moved over with her brother and had only been in the country for six months. She always walked to and from the university with her brother, and uh, uh, people were wondering why on that particular day had she walked by herself. The morning her brother hadn't been there to chaperone her to university was the same morning the killer had been lying in wait for his next opportunity. She had done that walk many times. It's a lovely walk, which is a local nature reserve. He came from behind and launched his, his knife attack on her. He took off her sunglasses in order to stab her in the eye. And during the course of the short but brutal assault, he stabbed her more than 30 times. The family had been left devastated by the terrible murder of Nahid. Nahid was a remarkable and gentle person who was loved for her kind and caring nature. In the first murder, what we see is the use of extreme violence. There's 102 knife wounds, and many of them are what we call knife tip wounds. They're not going to kill the victim. They're purely done to cause pain. In the second murder, what we see is a reduction in the number of knife wounds, but he still keeps the knife tip wounds. So it's almost like he's honing his technique. But the most striking similarity in these two murders is the stabbing of the eye. In the first murder, we see the victim has been stabbed in the eye, but we don't know at that point was it planned. So it's really chilling that then we see the second murder where the killer actually planned to stab the victim in the eye. And we know this because he removed her sunglasses in order to stab her in the eye. What we're starting to see here is emerging MO. It's almost like the killer wants that to be the feature of his murders. The police were careful not to release the stabbing of the eyes linking the murders. Yet with two brutal stabbings that happened just months apart, fear gripped the community. And people had begun to make their own connections. Many people were looking at the two attacks as looking very similar and ultimately related. So the talk in the town and of course the talk through the papers was that there could be a serial killer on the loose. The whole community were just scared to go out because nobody knew who the person was that done it. I was walking around in Colchester with my sister one evening and I remember saying to her, we could have walked past the person that has done this. I was born and bred in Essex, I've lived here all of my life. Uh, so I myself, as well as covering the murder as a journalist, 
uh, was also part of the community and felt that, that fear and concern about walking around alone late at night. There would have already been intense fear because a man had been murdered in a, what is usually a quiet town. But something that the public do in a case like that, it's, it's called just world belief. It's that they think, well, it won't happen to me. That was night time. He was drunk. He was in a vulnerable position. I'm OK. So then when a second murder occurs that happens in the morning, when a young girl is just simply walking to university, that then changes things. That means it could be me. Everybody is potentially a victim. And that would have really heightened fear. No one expected the killer would turn out to be a 15-year-old schoolboy. Treat yourself to the best gift in history this holiday season. Enjoy unlimited access to award-winning podcasts and thousands of hours of original history documentaries released weekly exclusively on History Hit. There are topics for all history lovers, from Pompeii to D-Day, Sign up via the link in the description for an exclusive discount. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to explore the past like never before with History Hit. After the murders of Jim Atfield and Nahid al Mania in early 2014, Colchester was on high alert. You could not mistake that there had been something bad happening in the town. The police presence was almost overbearing at times and the police were working tirelessly to catch the killer. You had more police than anyone in the town's ever seen on the streets. They were patrolling day and night, and at the time, I remember thinking that's actually what people needed because they were scared. But frustratingly for the police, the killer had covered their tracks well. The community were, of course, extremely alarmed that a person who had killed had not been arrested and the result was that police from other areas were uh, brought into the area. I was drafted into Colchester to work in the additional manpower requirements. The other problem for the police was that we didn't have an awful lot to go on. We had no sightings, no witnesses, no phone call had come in to say, oh, you know, there's a fight going on, there's a row, or there's someone acting strangely. We've taken over 1,300 statements, spoken to over uh, 950 witnesses. There are now 4,500 exhibits uh, in the system, and we continue to work our way through over 150,000 hours of CCTV. All the police could do was keep appealing to the public in the hope that someone would come forward with information. After Nahid al was killed, we were given handouts of specific items of clothing that the police had interesting. I'm keen to identify and speak to a man who was described as being on the Salary Brook Trail. What's distinctive about this man is the jacket he's described as wearing. At the time it was described to us as an Italian designer jacket, so we ran that extensively. The police had to commit quite a lot of resources in a bid to catch the killer. The total policing operation cost in the order of £2.6 million. Yet despite the extensive police effort, a year on from the murders, police were no closer to catching the killer. Essex Police Control Room. Hi, I wonder if you can help me. I'm actually on the Salary Brook, um, the Long Ridge end of the trail, where that murder was last year. But then in May 2015, the police got lucky. And there's a very suspicious guy down there who's just standing there. He's got... A jacket that looks very similar to what was all over the paper and everything. A call came in from a local dog walker who'd spotted someone acting suspiciously. He was hiding under a bridge wearing gloves. One of the things that really stood out for her was the Italian jacket. She said she'd seen that all over the media. That really stuck in her mind. The suspicious individual was James Fairweather. A police officer who was unarmed uh, came to investigate and the dog walker stayed at the scene to direct the officer to the right place and also warn others walking along the path not to approach that area where she had spotted James. She said that she saw pure evil in his eyes. I think for her she found it a very troubling experience uh, to realise how close she had been to a double murderer who potentially was looking to kill again. She could have been his next victim. So the police attended and arrested him 
initially on suspicion of possession of a bladed article. In an unbelievable stroke of luck, the police had finally found the killer, only to be stunned that he was a 15-year-old schoolboy. I made the assumption it was done by a male adult because of the nature and ferocity and violence of the attacks. Statistically speaking, this type of crime would be carried out by an adult. So when we find out that it's actually been carried out by a 15-year-old schoolboy, that makes this shocking. He was taken to the police station and interviewed initially about having the knife, but he spontaneously confessed to the two murders. I saw him, it was, where, it was laying on the grass. I can't like that, it was like, I just fast asleep, where he was drunk. He described in detail what, what he had done. Went up to him, stood over like that, not helping that. I stabbed him first there. He admitted to um, both killings. I've done it a few times. While I was doing that, my voices were laughing and laughing and laughing louder and louder. Uh, and said at that stage that voices had told him to kill. Some of the voices were talking to me. You need to make a sacrifice or we're going to come and get you. You need to do it. Who was James Fairweather? Why did this boy, described at primary school as a quiet and well-behaved child, sensitive to the needs of others, go on to commit such violent crimes in his teens? James, as a young teenager, was a, was a good boy. He, he attended school, he had good attendance. We have new school newsletters praising him for that. He had an interest in darts and other hobbies and interests, and, and nothing about him particularly stood out, certainly to his peers and those that knew him. James Fairweather frequented a darts club in Colchester with his dad, his fellow players. They all spoke highly of him. I remember one man saying clearly that he was like a dormouse. He hardly made a sound, and he was a perfectly reasonable, nice boy. He looked like it looked like a son who respected his father. And what I see here by looking at this person's early childhood is there's no telltale signs, there's no evidence of trauma or neglect. He's part of a loving family. He's got a close relationship with his parents, a close relationship with his grandmother. He's described as a kind, quiet, and sensitive to the needs of others boy. However, when I start to go through his timeline, we start to see those early teens, and there's now some indicators of a more troubling boy. He was bullied quite intensively at school due to his ears. Uh, he had nicknames of Dumbo and FA Cup. It's absolutely certain that the bullying had an impact on him. The impact of bullying on any young person is really quite devastating, and it has long-term damaging effects on them. It has effects on their personality, it has effects on their mental health, that they feel low in mood. It has effect on their confidence as they develop into an adult. So it's, it's devastating what can happen to a child. So this definitely would have been part of the picture that helps us understand how he changes in those early teens. Age 13, James also had to deal with the sudden loss of his grandmother had been a key influence in his life. Any one of the factors that we can see in his life doesn't explain his behaviour in any way because many young people mourn a close relative, a grandparent, and don't turn into a violent murderer. And his grandmother was a huge protective factor for him. So the loss of hair would have been hugely significant for him. Certainly after the death of his grandmother, uh, he seemed to become a bit more violent and engaging negatively with his peers at school. The big turning point came when James had his first violent confrontation with a knife. He was on a local estate and he was targeted and threatened by a group of youths with a knife. And all those feelings of resentment would have potentially built up again. So now we've got this young man who's been bullied, feels vulnerable, feels different to everybody else, has been isolated, and he's probably feeling angry. And then we see him then using a knife, 
that for me is quite a big trigger. I spent a lot of time with James Fairweather's former classmates. Uh, one of the things that came up was his descent, I suppose, into being, uh, for want of a better phrase, a bad boy in school. He had told teachers that when he grew up, he wanted to be a murderer. He had told everyone in the school that he was going to bring a knife into school and carry out a massacre. He was fantasizing about killing in his school. He wanted to kill his head teacher. He wanted people to know that he was capable of killing. A year after James was mugged at knife point, his burgeoning obsession with violence began to escalate further. James Fairweather had actually committed a knife point robbery at the parade of shops close to his home. Stealing cigars and a number of other small, low-value items. This was the start of the change of his personality. He then has a knife in his hand that he gains control in that robbery of the local shop. And I think that was the first time that James Fairweather had a sense of feeling empowered, but it made him feel good. And I think that is the point that he realized the sense of power that violence would give him. It's only three months after robbing the shop with a knife that he commits his first murder. So we see an escalation in violence. James was not given a custodial sentence. This is often the case for a, for a youth committing a first offence. As a result of robbing his local shop, James Fairweather had been known to police throughout the whole investigation. And soon after Nahid's murder, police had even spoken to him as part of routine questioning of anyone previously involved in a knife offence. His mother actually gave him an alibi. Having spoken to him on the phone earlier, she believed he'd been at home the whole time. I don't think for a moment, having met her and spoken to her, that she was deliberately lying to cover up for James. I think she genuinely believed that. Satisfied with Fairweather's alibi, the police ruled him out of their inquiries, and he'd remained at large for another year, while Colchester had stayed overwhelmed by fear. A year after he committed two violent murders, James Fairweather was arrested as he hunted for his next victim. He was brought in by police and spontaneously confessed to the killings of Jim Atfield and Nahid Almanir. And he goes, he goes, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. Do it, do it. So I went up to him, can I stand up? What was quite remarkable was how emotionless and flat James was in describing what he had done. Watching a 15-year-old describe what he did and how he used the knife was uh, chilling. There's almost a complete detachment from what he's saying and from what he's describing. Some of the voices were talking to me. You need to make a sacrifice or we're going to come and get you. You need to do it. And I saw him. It was, where, it was laying on the grass. <laughs> like that. It was like... Just, just fast asleep, where he was drunk. Then he goes, he goes, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. It's almost like he's reveling in it, but without the emotion. Can I stand up? Like, yes. Went up to him. Stood over like that. I stabbed him first there. I've done it a few times. And what that says to me is that he was really dangerous. And if he wasn't arrested, he would have absolutely gone on to kill again. While I was doing that, my voices were laughing and laughing and laughing louder and louder. On the same day Fairweather confessed, police charged him with both murders. And news spread that these horrific killings had been committed by a 15-year-old child. I was angry, I was confused, because I was like, how could somebody that age even dream of doing anything like that to another human being? The atmosphere around the town at the time of the arrest was still one of disbelief because we all knew at this point how brutal and how violent the murders had been and there was really no understanding this could have been the work of a boy age 15 or 16. With Fairweather in custody, the investigation turned its attention to why a teenager had committed such shocking crimes. 
when police searched the home of James Fairweather, they discovered a lot of violent pornographic uh, movies and, and very violent content films as well. And also a number of knives were discovered in his home that seemed to belong to James. They quickly built a picture of a young man obsessed with violence and murder. He had a dangerous interest in serial killers, specifically Peter Sutcliffe. He played violent computer games. He had spent considerable time researching extreme violence and indeed pornography on the internet. And he had unfettered access to the internet when his parents were both at work. James spent an awful amount of time alone, but he also spent a lot of time unsupervised at home. He's watching material that no child should be watching. Watching violent pornography, or watching violent films, or playing violent video games, doesn't turn a non-violent individual into becoming a violent murderer. However, what it does is it desensitizes them to violence particularly in the case of James Fairweather, where we know he had an obsession with violent pornography, an obsession with serial killers. There's a reason why they're given that certificate of 18. There's a reason why we don't allow children to watch that kind of material, because it will have a direct impact on their developing brain. During my career, I've covered uh, a few different murder trials, unfortunately, comes with, with the job. Uh, but this murder trial really stood out. The tension in the courtroom was palpable. 11 months after his arrest, Fairweather would stand trial at Guildford Crown Court, close to where he was being held in a psychiatric unit. I attended the court every day, and it was difficult, but I felt I had to do it for Jim. It was like heartbreaking sitting there listening to all the evidence. We walked out every evening with tears rolling down our faces in disbelief. In the trial that spanned two weeks, Fairweather's defence hinged on his mental state at the time of the killings. Because James Fairweather had admitted to the killings, the prosecution had uh, a relatively easy task of laying out the case, and they had to set out that James Fairweather was capable and was fully aware of what he was doing when he committed those two murders. In contrast, the defence were not there to say that James Fairweather was not responsible for these killings in a practical, physical sense, but actually his mental state at the time meant that he couldn't be held accountable for his actions. I think James always maintained, and maintained at trial, that uh, voices in his head were telling him to sacrifice people, which is how he phrased it. And so we were able to focus the defence on the sole issue of diminished responsibility. If a person's responsibility is diminished, which would reduce a murder charge from murder to uh, manslaughter? To suggest James couldn't be held fully responsible for murder, the defence built their case around the voices he'd claimed to hear and looked to James's autism, only diagnosed shortly before the trial, to explain his obsessive nature and detached manner. I stabbed him first there. I've done it a few times. He was a very troubled young man. He was only 15 years of age at the time. He was very suspicious of everybody that he came into contact with. He was convinced that the prison authorities, the uh, warders at the prison, were spying on him. He, he was very difficult to engage with. He found it very difficult to answer straightforward questions. He, you couldn't make eye cont contact with him at all. Uh, he'd stare at the table and uh, just look down. And the minute I met James, it struck me that he may very well be autistic. And that only was diagnosed once the psychiatrists who were caring for James during his time on remand started to carry out their tests on him. A symptom of autism is a fixation, an obsession on something. But mostly that is on benign things, obsessions with things that don't harm. What we see in this case is that James Fairweather was fixated on violent pornography. 
serial killers, murder, and that obsession grew to the point that on a daily basis, he was fascinating about committing murder. The fact that somebody suffers from autism, of course, is no defense to any criminal charge, least of all murder. It's a factor which the psychiatrist took into account in determining whether he was suffering from diminished responsibility or not. Everyone at the trial accepted Fairweather's recent diagnosis of autism, but ultimately concluded that it wasn't a defense for murder. Now, the focus was on Fairweather's alleged psychosis that manifested itself in the voices that told him to kill. Three psychiatrists said that they believed that James Fairweather did have psychosis. Psychosis is abnormalities in functioning in certain domains, for example, uh, delusions and hallucinations. So hearing voices is the most common form of a hallucination. Voices are talking to me, you need to make a sacrifice, or we're gonna come and get you, you need to do it. It's a very separate entity to their own internal voice. It's them hearing another person's voice. It's often commanding them to do something. Then it goes, it goes, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. Do it, do it. We called three psychiatrists on behalf of the defense. All three have diagnosed James as suffering from psychosis. They accepted the genuineness of his claim that he was hearing voices in his head. However, the prosecution's psychiatrist, Dr. Joseph, took a very different view. The psychiatrist for the prosecution believed that James Fairweather was lying about the voices. And some of the reasons put forward for that is that the nature in which he planned the murders. He went along wearing gloves to cover up his fingerprints, knowing that his fingerprints were on the DNA database. He threw away the knife. It seemed to be that, on the one hand, we've got this description of a very distressed uh, young man who's hearing voices commanding him to do something. But on the other hand, we have this very lucid, organized offender who is able to cover their tracks after the murder, and those two don't sit together. Is he psychotic, or is he this manipulative, controlled individual? Dr. J.C. evidence was quite powerful and undermines the uh, account he was giving of uh, psychosis and the fact that he had carried out the, the stabbings whilst he was in a rage and then suddenly came to. Was Fairweather falsely betraying himself to the jury as a psychotic teenager so he could get away with murder? Colchester had been gripped by fear for 14 months. The whole community were just scared to go out. The killer was searching for his third victim when finally the manhunt came to an end. She saw pure evil in his eyes. Resulting in the shocking revelation that the murderer was 15-year-old James Fairweather. I stabbed him first there. Fairweather confessed, claiming voices made him do it, a claim his defence lawyers took to trial. Some of the voices are talking to me. You need to make a sacrifice, or we're going to come and get you. You need to do it. The jury had to decide. Was it the result of psychosis driving him to kill, or was this cold-blooded murder? Could Fairweather have faked hearing voices? Was this all part of his plan to get a lesser sentence? During the course of the trial, we discovered that he'd been searching up things on his phone and on the internet uh, around serial killers, but also defences they had used in court to try and reduce their sentence or get off their crimes. And the prosecution pointed to this as a suggestion that James was making up his uh, mental difficulties in order to avoid a conviction for murder. There was no evidence that James had researched symptoms of psychosis, for example. All of his research was in relation to serial killers and what they had done, rather than any medical defences that they had advanced at trial. And so it meant, essentially, that a 15-year-old boy with no medical experience had successfully deceived three experienced psychiatrists What is really difficult to determine in this case is whether James Fairweather was trying to get 
off with manslaughter and therefore faking his psychotic symptoms, or was he really in a psycho psychotic episode when he committed those murders? It's interesting for me that when he was interviewed as part of his pre-sentence report for the robbery on the shop with the knife, he made no mention at that point of the voices, even though he later said that the voices started before then. He also seemed to be very lucid at the time of the murders. And also there's the other aspects of his personality that he seemed to be quite disturbed. My closing speech to the jury, I described it as a perfect storm of his autism, his psychosis, and the lack of supervision that he was getting at home. I don't believe that James Fairweather was hearing voices, no. I believe he was saying that to obviously get off from manslaughter, yeah. The day Jim died is the day I died. Why has this happened to Jim, you know? What has Jim ever done to deserve something like that? He was just such a lovely guy, and we always called him Gentle Jim because he was just, wouldn't hurt anybody. With the defence claiming Fairweather's mental state meant he couldn't be held responsible for the killings, and the prosecution painting a picture of a cold-hearted murderer in control of his actions, it came down to whether the jury believed Fairweather's claim of psychosis. Ultimately, the jury did not buy his account of these hallucinations. And on the 22nd of April, 2016, three months before his 18th birthday, the jury were unanimous in finding James Fairweather guilty of double murder. James Fairweather was sentenced by a High Court judge to 27 years in prison. And Colchester breathed a sigh of relief. An order was made for him to be transferred to a secure unit, and he will remain there until that treatment comes to an end, until he is considered to be fit. And from there, he will be transferred to spend the rest of the, the time of that sentence in custody. The reaction of the uh, local community to James's sentence was one of relief. And the general feeling I got from people was that the sentence did fit the crime. When we got the verdict of guilty, it was just a wave of relief that come over our bodies. Getting that actually made us feel as though there was just a little bit of justice for Jim and the Heed. The local community felt justice had been done, safe in the knowledge that this serial killer obsessed teen was now behind bars. We now know he collected the our newspaper cuttings on his first killing of, G of Jim Atfield as a, I suppose people would say that's as a, as a trophy to what he was doing. He kept a scrapbook of all the clippings of all the stories that we did. He clearly wanted to revel in the difficulty he was putting the public through. He was reading every day about the anguish of Jim Atfield's mother and Jim Atfield's family. He was reading about the fear that people were experiencing, not only in Greenstead, but across Colchester. It's pretty clear that he was enjoying what he was doing. I think James Fairweather committed these murders because he was a deeply disturbed young man. Uh, however, there was clearly something there in his uh, environment, in the material he was, he was viewing, uh, that all combined uh, to create someone that ultimately went on to, to kill twice and, and potentially could have killed again. In the judge's summing up in this case, he talked about how James Fairweather wanted to carry out his sadistic, violent fantasies and how he was obsessed with other serial killers. Peter Sutcliffe, he stabbed his victims in the eye and it's said that he did this because the eye remained open and he got some kind of pleasure from doing that and Fairweather purposely stabbed his victims in the eye. So it's almost like he wanted to emulate the serial killers that he was so obsessed with. And the notoriety that comes with that would have been something he desired. But could the authorities have picked up on Fairweather's dangerous obsessions before they went too far? I was quite angry when I heard that he had already caused upset by holding up a shop at knife point. And to find out that he only got a slap on the wrist and was then allowed to walk free and just a few months later then go on to kill 
despicable, really. I think Jim's death could have been prevented, yes, because if James Fairweather had been given a harsher sentence for carrying a weapon in the first place, then he may not have been out there to have committed the crimes he committed. It was a unique case, my understanding is that James is the youngest person in this country to have been convicted of two separate murders. The ferocity of them makes them unique, in my view, given his young age. The minimum term that the judge set in James's case was 27 years. That is, for a boy of that age, a very long minimum term indeed. Fairweather will be in his 40s before he can even be considered for release by the parole board. Given his disputed mental health, does this teenage boy deserve life in prison? One of the difficulties with the jury's finding of murder rather than manslaughter is that James will be kept in a, a normal prison. There isn't the medical and psychiatric support that there would be in a psychiatric unit. Had he been convicted of manslaughter, the judge could have made what's called a hospital order, which has pretty much the same effect as a life sentence, except the decision as to release is made when a panel of psychiatrists felt that he didn't present a danger to the public, rather than the parole board, which is made up of non-specialists. The uh, James Fairweather case is a, a, a case that no one involved with it will ever forget. One can't help but wonder whether, if his autism had been diagnosed at a much earlier stage and a suitable support system put in place, including input at home from his parents, whether with greater supervision and with more assistance for his difficulties, which were undoubtedly there, uh, he may not have carried out these killings. That's a question that's impossible to answer, but one can't help speculating on whether actually failure of that diagnosis meant that the system let him down. James Fairweather was bullied. He had been targeted because of his physical appearance. He had been vulnerable because of his autism, because of his potential developing personality disorder, and because of his the question mark over whether he was in a psychotic episode or not. And he carried knives. That says to me that there were signs there. And if he had got help younger, maybe we could have prevented these terrible murders occurring. <laughs>